All right, so thank you very much for having the paper to be included in the program. I'm really happy to uh, participate to uh, the inaugural session of CHAMP. Uh, this is a, a joint work with Jean-Guillaume and Frank. Frank in this, uh, is in the, the audience. Uh, and we uh, intend to update the, tr the new uh, Keynesian model to include the climate externality in it. And so yesterday we had a meet, we had a speech from Isabel Schnabel, which was really interesting about disinflation, but she also provided other interesting speeches. And one of them was about the future of monetary policy in a world with a warming planet or under a green transition. And so in the future, we can imagine two extreme scenarios, one of them in which we will engage into no reduction of carbon emission. And so in that situation, the planet would warm a lot. And so by increasing sea level, by the increase in adverse weather events, by a lower uh, yield return for crops from the aridification of region, that will yield to lower um, productivity and that will yield higher prices. And so this is referred to as in the literature as climate inflation. But on the other side, we can also be more optimistic and imagine that the economy, I mean, the fiscal policy could engage into increasing carbon tax. This will reduce carbon emission. And so uh, there will be an increase in the price of fossil fuels. There will be also an increase for the demand for specific raw materials to green the economy. And in turn, this will yield to what is called greenflation. So there are two possible sources of inflation that could happen in the future related to the climate, either if we increase or reduce our carbon emission. And so how should the central bank react in those scenarios? So we're not going to uh, uh, evaluate whether the central bank should reduce carbon emission in a way, this is not the topic of the paper, but how it should manage uh, the, the implication of those policies. And so to answer this question, we need to understand uh, what will be the effect of climate change and the climate mitigation policies on, on the economy. And so obviously the new Keynesian model that we use in central bank has not been designed to answer those questions. And so in this paper, we uh, propose to develop a new Keynesian climate model in which we'll extend this model to include another equation in which we will have carbon accumulation to take into account the, warming, the effect of global warming. And so we're going to pick this element from the uh, integrated assessment literature that is extremely well known for um, evaluating uh, climate-related issue. So if you have been, uh, I mean, in the media, you have seen many predictions from IPCC. And so these predictions are based on the IM model in which you know, they project long-term projection of output, of temperatures, carbon emission, and so on. And so we built on this literature to extend the new Keynesian model. Where we want to also have, uh, we want to data ground this model, so we're going to estimate it for the world economy because the externality is as, at the world level. Uh, and this way we want to keep track of, of, of all the nonlinearity that we have from climate change because, I mean, uh, climate change is a structural issue. Uh, the green transition is also, also a structural issue, so we want to keep track of those nonlinearity. Uh, when, uh, when we uh, solve the, the problem. And once we have estimated this model, we can use it to make some out-of-sample forecasts. And so we're going to project what would happen in the future under a mitigation policy, so basically under the greenflation scenario, or under the laissez-faire scenario in which no carbon policy is implemented. And this way, this will allow us to gauge the effect of climate change and climate mitigation policies on, on inflation and hence on monetary policy. But you know, in macro, we have rich uh, models, but in the end, when we want to uh, go into numerical simulation, we always, or mostly, uh, linearize our, our model. And I mean, with, uh, with, our, um, with the climate issue, uh, this is not something that is uh, possible because uh, climate change will permanently affect the propagation mechanism. If we engage into a carbon transition, this will permanently shift our economy to some uh, new equilibrium, and so there is not the usual steady state approach that we can have to apply our perturbation method in that, in that case. So we're going to use the Fair and Taylor approach in order to uh, keep track of those uh, nonlinearities, and we're going to use an inversion filter to estimate the model in nonlinear ways. So related, I mean, our paper is going to be related to three core literature. The first one I discussed earlier is the IM literature, so those long-term models that you may have seen in the media. 
Um, but those models are extremely um, uh, low, I mean, they take the low frequency component, but they do not take into account uh, the short-term component that we have in the data, so they are not really informative about the short-term conduct of uh, policies, in particular monetary policy. The second literature is the DEG with some environmental um, uh, constraints, so this is the EDG literature, and see, this literature extend our usual business cycle model to include some um, environmental constraint, but they usually do not take into account the very long-term effect the from the structural changes that we have in our economies. And the last strand of the literature is the usual new Keynesian literature with the uh, macro textbook of uh, Woodford, but also medium scale estimated model from um, Smith and Wouters. But obviously those models are without climate change. So for this presentation, I will first start with the uh, new Keynesian model. And so I will start with the basic one, I mean the basic new Keynesian model, and step by step I will show you how we're going to change it in order to take into account the climate constraint. So the micro foundations micro foundation are quite the same, so you have some household, those also are uh, utility maximizing, you have firms which are profit maximizing, and in between you have a central bank that adjusts the interest rate to dampen nominal rigidities. So once again, we have our three core equations, so the IS, DPC, and the monetary policy curve. And so the first equation is the determination of, of quantity. So um, we have the detrended um, GDP that appears, and this is the uh, Euler equation in which um, current decisions are based on uh, the, um, the future marginal utility of consumption adjusted by uh, the interest rates set by the central bank. And you know we want to think in, uh, in quantities, so we don't want to have consumption, so we introduce uh, an additional auxiliary variable to translate any unit of consumption into uh, output equivalent. The second equation is the, um, is the uh, Phillips curve, so, and here under Rotenberg pricing, so simply inflation is related to, uh, to the current and all the discounted sum of future marginal costs that will happen in the future. And because we want to keep the model as tractable as possible, the marginal cost here is based with one input in the production function, that is uh, labor. And the last equation is the interest rate equation, so the Taylor rule. And this Taylor rule is, um, is uh, also, um, is also um, uh, adjusted by the uh, change in the target of the central bank, that is P star. We also have the shocks, the usual shocks, uh, the first one is the demand shock, I mean, supply shock and monetary policy shock, so nothing really new here. And finally, we eventually can have trend in the new Keynesian model, so some people include some inflation target, for instance, and here we're going to uh, impose a deterministic process on the inflation target to uh, capture the long decline that we have in inflation uh, in sample. There is also a technological trend uh, that, that appears for the discounting, and so in, in, uh, in, um, the, uh, in our model here, we're going to have a vanishing productivity, so basically the rate of productivity is exogenous and is declining over time because of, um, to match the, the declining uh, growth that we have in, uh, in, uh, in our economies. So this is the basic model. But since we want to work on carbon mitigation policies, carbon mitigation policies are always announced in advance. And so if, uh, if we have a policy that is announced in advance, uh, we, uh, we end up in the same issue as the forward guidance uh, puzzle. In a sense that any policy that is announced is going to materialize in present value into extreme uh, large values. And so to deal with this, we're going to build on the literature by just introducing two attenuation channels, one on the discounted Euler equation and the other one on the, uh, the Phillips curve equation. So to introduce those two discounting, we're going to have income risk for the household, and so some house, the household we have the probability to get unemployed, and if he gets unemployed, he will get uh, some compensation from, uh, from an insurance. And so this way, you can see the one that omega here is going to reduce how much uh, forward-looking variables are going to affect uh, uh, the, the value of, uh, of GDP now. The second uh, discounting is simply on the PC curve. We simply assume that firm has some probability to exit the market. And this way, once again, this will attenuate how much they are looking forward in their, 
and in their pricing decision. And if they leave the market, they are going to uh, consume their, their dividends. But we can also now discuss the climate uh, problem. And so you can see at the bottom here that we have one more new equation. That is the climate change equation, the CC equation. And so M here is the stock of carbon that we have in the atmosphere. And so basically, if M is zero, it means that there is no carbon emission that was emitted by human activity. There is also emission here have to be tracked in level because the climate issue is a cumulative problem in which we, we must keep track of the level of emission and the level of the carbon stock because this is what is going to determine how much global warming we have and so how much of, um, of uh, damages we have in the, in the economy. So basically, we cannot use our um, detrending fashion that we have in macro to get rid of trend. We must keep track of, of this, this level, and this is why we have to reverse the detrending on emission. And so emission here are going to be determined by a deterministic decoupling trend. So if you look at data for, uh, for uh, the world data on uh, emission to GDP ratio, I mean, the, the level of emission per unit of dollar produced is naturally declining through energy efficiency. But this decline is not enough to avoid uh, climate change. We also have an exogenous deterministic trend for uh, TFP that is taken from integrated assessment literature in which TFP is increasing but declining uh, over time. Um, we have also uh, a population dynamic that is also exogenous that is meant to capture the long-term uh, growth of population. And so population here is going to be, um, to be at the end of 11 billion of people on the planet uh, living at the end of the century, which is consistent with the United Nations uh, forecast. And this is the uh, extensive margin part of emission. And the last one is a mean, an emission shock because we want to have some stochastic effect on this variable as well in order to capture and estimate the, the parameter on this equation as well. But because we have um, climate change, climate change is also going to affect the economy. And the way it works in integrated assessment model is assumed that, that climate change is going to damage the productivity of, of uh, the production side of firms. And so basically, it will appear in the new Keynesian model as an increase in the marginal cost of producing goods. And so if the level of carbon emission increases, this is going to increase the marginal cost of production, and so hence it will increase inflation. But policymakers can implement a carbon tax, and so tau -T is going to be that carbon tax uh, that will mimic the, uh, mitigate, that will be um, uh, take, um, making the economy to go uh, greener. And so this carbon tax is going to shift some mitigation expenditure. So the fact that if you go to a green economy, you have to, uh, to close coal plants and replace them with new uh, facilities, and this is going to be costly and will call for additional investment expenditures. The fact that we have to go also to a green economy will force firms to decarbonize their production line. So there is also a cost for the firm to, uh, to decarbonize their production, production lines, but also there is a cost if they don't comply to, the carbon, to, to reduce their carbon emission, they have to pay the tax as well. So there are two effects that will also increase the marginal cost of production during the transition. And finally, if we increase the carbon tax, this will reduce carbon emission and stabilize the climate. So this is the, the, the goal of the climate policy. This is to reduce carbon emission um, through abatement. So once we have the model that is, uh, that is uh, given, we can estimate the deep parameter of the model. So basically, we're going to use world data, uh, with data starting 1985 up to, uh, to uh, 2023. And we're going to have, I mean, we have four core uh, equations, so we're going to have four uh, observable variables to estimate the model. And the way we proceed is that to estimate the model, we're going to have uh, uh, two steps, basically, to estimate the model. So the first equation is the very long trend, the stru tr structural trend that we have between the initial condition that we provide up to the very long stationary equilibrium that we will reach in a, in, a, in a very long period of time. And we want to have stochastic variables that are included. So we want to capture as well the business cycle component. So basically, in the second step, we're going to use the extended pass to include st uh, stochastic uh, variable. And so what we're going to do here, instead of re re updating the pass 
from, no, from the realization of the shock up to the terminal period, that would be extremely computationally costly, we're going to reduce by opening a window, which is the extended pass algorithm, and so S is the number of period that we allow for, for fluctuation to live. And so as long as S is large enough, this is going to uh, reduce the computational burden without uh, having some, uh, some implication for the accuracy of the estimation. The third equation is the measurement um, equation. So basically, we have a subset of variables, endogenous variables, which are observable. And the fourth one is the uh, distribution of shocks. And when we, can, we estimate the model, so we find the, the sequence of shocks that replicate the data, we can build um, the likelihood function and use our, use our usual routine to, to estimate the, the, the model. But there is one issue uh, that we have to deal with is the path of the carbon tax. I mean, the decision that we're going to take, as, I mean, the policymaker we're going to take in the future are also affecting our estimation because any decision that is taken out of sample is actually having implication on the expectation in sample. So the way we're going to manage it is simply to introduce the pass of the Paris Agreement consistent carbon tax. And we're, we're going to uh, use uh, a parameter that is verified here that will measure, that we are going to estimate how much of the people in our economy believe in the realization of the carbon tax. And this is a way for us to let the data be informative about how much will be in the future from a market-based perspective, the, 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 the fraction of people believing in the realization of the Paris Agreement scenario. So this is the calibrated parameter and the estimated parameter. And to illustrate you this um, separation uh, between the, the deterministic component that we initially compute and then the stochastic component that we add, you can see the, 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 the implication of this and the fact that the shocks are always making our economy to gravitate around the deterministic path. So now we can have a look at what's going on in the future with respect to the carbon tax. So we can use the model to make some out of sample forecast. And to do this, we're gonna use our two extreme scenario. The first one is the Paris Agreement scenario in which the carbon tax is implemented. So VAFA become one. And the other one, we are in a laissez-faire scenario. So uh, Trump gets back to office and there is no engagement at all uh, with respect to the implementation of the carbon tax. And so VAFA is equal to zero. And in between, you have the one that we estimated. So this is here the pass uh, for all the main variable of interest um, with different um, carbon uh, tax scenarios. And so you can see on the A graph that we have a scenario in which the carbon tax could increase consistently with the Paris Agreement. So this is the green line. And you can see in the B, um, the B panel that this will make carbon emission to decline consistently with the Paris Agreement with, and with the target of zero emission by 2050. But this tax is gonna be recessionary. You can see it on the panel D. The fact that we increase a lot the carbon tax, this will force firms to decarbonize. This will uh, divert a fraction of resources toward the decarbonization. And this will be costly in the short term for, uh, for firms and so for the society. In that case, you can see in panel D that we will have more inflation. So it's at a world level, so the level of inflation at the, in the world is much higher than uh, the euro area. So don't be surprised that the numbers are, are bigger. And this will provide an additional inflation because of the carbon tax effect that are inflationary. And so in panel E, you can see that the central bank is going to increase interest rate in response to, to, uh, to reduce inflation. But if we are in a laissez-faire economy, so there is no carbon tax that is implemented, this is probably the, the, the scenario that is the most likely, there is a, an increase in emission in panel D. And so you can see that output is naturally uh, going to be below the trend and this is a result of uh, the damages that we have from climate change. And so in that case, I mean, monetary policy will be relatively more accommodative. So the question is now, how can we, exp um, to, how can we uh, explain the mechanism? I mean, how can we explain the, the quantities and prices? So what we're going to do, because our model is simple, we can use this simplicity to extract uh, each forces into, into uh, separate blocks. And so we f first start with the aggregate demand equation that we can split into three complementary forces. The first one is just 
the, the effect of the IS on the determination of, of, of quantities. So this is just the, uh, the um, forward sum of interest rate, of real interest rates. The second one is the green investment, so how much investment is going to, to, to boom our economy because we, we, we engage into the transition. And the last one is a kind of residual from the nominal rigidities and the exit probability for firms. And so in panel A, you have the figure that I showed you before, and B, C, and D are these three forces. And so if you sum B plus C plus D, you end up with A. And every variable I express in deviation from the technological neutral trend, which means that um, it includes, I mean, the, the deviation includes in the, the, the consequences of climate change, but also the consequences of stochastic variable and the consequences of the carbon tax mitigation policy. And so you can see on the panel C that if we engage into the Paris Agreement, we have a shift in the green investment. And so by uh, at, the, at the peak, we should spend 6% of additional output into reducing carbon emission, which is a sizable uh, number. And so if we have a boom uh, and we have also an increase in the carbon tax, monetary policy is going to react by increasing the real interest rate. And this will shift strongly the IS effect downward and will dominate in the short term. And this is why on average, the aggregate demand in the short term is lower than usual. And you can see at the end in panel A that if we engage in that carbon policy consistent with the Paris Agreement, we will save the planet, but we will still have 1% of GDP that will be lost permanently because of climate change and the, the stock of emission that we have already emitted. But in contrast, if we live in the laissez-faire world in which no carbon mitigation policy is implemented, I mean, monetary policy is going to face more and more, um, the marginal cost is going to increase, inflation is going to increase, and so the monetary policy is going to react by increasing the real interest rate. And this is going to shift the IS curve downward uh, proportionally to the increase in temperatures. And so as damage are growing, uh, the, the IS is going to permanently deteriorate over time, and you can see that by the end of the century, we could have about between three and 4% of output that could be lost because of climate change. And this is consistent with usual uh, integrated as you, uh, assessment model, and it's a pretty optim uh, optimistic perspective because some of those uh, forecasts are much more uh, pessimistic with respect to the cost of, of climate. So we're quite conservative. Now we want to understand as well the determination of prices in that situation. So we have the marginal cost of production that is actually a function of the standard component that we have in the new Keynesian textbook, so basically the, the real wage, but we also have also the damages uh, from, from climate change. And so we want to know how much the standard component, the climate change component is going to be affected, as well as the greenflation component that is composed of the cost of abatement, that is the first term in this equation, and the second term is the cost of the carbon tax. And so if we can decompose the marginal cost, we can um, express the marginal cost into, uh, into uh, inflation equivalent. And so the second equation splits inflation fluctuation into four components, four complementary forces, the standard parts from the real wage, the second one from the climate, uh, and the third one from green inflation, and the last one from the exogenous shock process. And so in panel A, you have once again the, the, the path of inflation, and you have in B, C, D, and E panels the contribution of each forces. And so if you sum all these forces, you get back to the, to the panel A. And so you can see in this panel that if we engage into the, the Paris Agreement, so basically if we increase carbon tax in order to reduce carbon emission, you can see in panel D that the green inflation term so the, the cost of the transition for firm is going to increase and materialize in a shift, a large shift in inflation. So green inflation term is going to be extremely high during the transition because of the carbon tax. But if you increase the carbon tax, you increase abatement expenditure, and so you end up with less fraction of resources which are devoted to, to consumption, and this deteriorates the wealth effect on the labor supply, and so the wage is going to decline in response. And so this is why the contribution uh, of, of um, the wages is going to uh, dampen the inflationary effect of greenflation. 
And you can see that there is some gain in engaging in, in uh, the, the transition because the climate, climate inflation block at, uh, is going to be stabilized because there is no more global warming. I mean, we're stabilized global warming, and so there is no more increase in the climate inflation, um, in the climate inflation uh, force. However, if we engage into no mitigation policy, you can see that the rise in the climate inflation term is going to increase a lot. We are going to live in a planet with more and more adverse weather events. We are going to have um, uh, a lot of uh, damages, you know, from sea level rising, uh, from a massive change in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in immigration from, uh, from regions which are arid to regions which are less arid. So there are going to be large shifts that will lead to an increase in, 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 uh, in, uh, in inflation that is um, explained here by the climate inflation uh, force. But also the fact that we, there is a disengagement from the carbon policy, there is also a reduction in the green inflation term that is going to dampen some of the inflationary effects. And finally, the standard term, that is the one that is related to the, the wage, is going to follow the marginal product of labor and so is going to decline naturally as the, the planet is warming. And so in turn, this explains the, 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 the realized uh, pass of inflation and drive most the pass of inflation for the laissez-faire scenario. Okay. All right, so conclusion, we have developed a, a simple four-dimensional new Keynesian model in which we include the climate externality and we have identify two core phenomena. The first one that is related to the effect of climate change on inflation, that we call the climate inflation, and the second one that is related to the inflationary effect of the carbon tax, that is called uh, the green inflation. And so right now we are working on, uh, on analyzing how sensitive is the outcome to different parameter scenario, as well as of the design of the monetary policy rule that also drive a lot the result in terms of inflation. And thanks a lot for your attention, and I look forward for Philip's discussion. Thank you very much. So, Philip. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me to discuss this paper. If Jean Guillaume, Frank, and Gauthier team up to analyze the climate effects in the New Keynesian model, then I know it's time to sharpen my pencil and look at these things very carefully. The usual disclaimer applies. So let me try to wrap up what the authors are doing in one slide, and then I will offer some comments. They look at the monetary policy challenges posed by climate change, and they can be broadly grouped into two parts. The first is climate inflation, the inflationary effects that come from a warming planet for example, through productivity effects from climate damages. Think about floods, heat waves, migration patterns. Uh, Gautier mentioned some channels. Second part is greenflation, the inflationary effects that arise from climate mitigation policies that affect the supply side and also prices. What they do, they break down the quantitative importance of these channels using an extended textbook monetary policy model. And what they find is large inflationary effects from both channels already today. I think that's also a very interesting methodological contribution. Uh, so I want to briefly highlight the added value uh, for the standard macro analysis, which are, of course, the climate features, climate mitigation, which is here captured by abatement costs, and also the productivity damages from climate change. But what is also interesting the authors do quite some acrobatics to introduce um, features that attenuate the forward-lookingness of our models. And I think that's also relevant for standard macro analysis. Me coming also from a climate modeling perspective, I see great added values through using the tools that we have in standard macro, such as Bayesian estimation. And Gautier has shown that they make quite some advances in the state-of-the-art technology available to us by using also nonlinear estimation techniques for these models. So that's very important. And typically, climate models are calibrated models. So it's interesting to bring in here an estimation perspective. It also captures the anticipatory behavior of agents. And often in climate science, these uh, models are solved recursively, meaning that um, forward-looking dynamics are not captured. At the same time, 
it maintains tractability. So Gautier has shown that they can boil down this model into four equations, which contrast to these thousands of equations that are typically in the integrated assessment models. So in my discussion, I will focus first on the quantitative results that I find very striking. Then I will discuss some modeling choices, for example, monetary policy conduct that really matters here for the results. Also, would suggest to clarify the role of the behavioral features. And then I will shift to some of our own work, which uses multi-sector models to analyze climate transition dynamics. If I have time, I might also comment on welfare and more broadly, climate change here is captured more as a slow-moving phenomena, but it might have also effects on volatility at the local level, and it could be another interesting avenue for another paper. So I'm not asking to do this here all in the same framework. Okay, so look, let's look at the results. The first thing that is striking are the huge effects of climate and green inflation in that model. So look at panel D, inflation differences between the Paris Agreement and the laissez-faire are about four percentage points and for decades. So that's a very striking result. So we see that there's an extreme relevance of climate and green inflation according to their model. At the same time, there's also a large effect on output in, as you can see in panel C. And what is extremely relevant and useful is the decomposition of the, of the effects. Where do they come from? So they propose a semi-linearization of the Phillips curve to break down the different parts of um, inflation arising from either climate damages or climate mitigation policies. So what is remarkable here is that the effect is already very large today. So if you look at the contribution of climate inflation today in panel C, that's about four percentage points of quarterly inflation. So that's a very large effect. And the same goes for the um, green inflation in the panel D. What is also interesting is that historical shocks, because the authors estimate their model, have a very persistent effect, as you can see in panel E. So the historical shocks, they only die out in um, about 80 years' time. So that suggests that there's quite some persistence in the model. Okay, let me wrap up my observations. <coughs> the Paris Agreement long-run output costs of around 1% of trend GDP here, which might be below other estimates when including climate damages, but there's a lot of uncertainty uh, around this. So. The Paris Agreement scenario also suge suggests that we would have on average three to four percentage points higher inflation for decades to come. And the very important decomposition reveals that the substantial contribution arises from climate inflation and green inflation even today. Then a first technical comment. We should keep in mind that in your modeling, the carbon tax is actually fairly low today. Plus, you introduce several features to attenuate forward-looking behavior. Plus, the Phillips curve estimated is very flat. So it is still striking that even with all these features, there's a very large effect coming apparently from forward-looking elements here. And maybe it's also difficult to disentangle this effect of a highly nonlinear curve using this proposed semilinearization, because even the standard term, so the usual non-climate feature part of the model, is extremely deflationary. Um, so perhaps I misunderstand the um, effects depicted in panel B, but they look extremely large, but maybe they also include some of the effects arising from climate and green inflation. In general, the literature, the current literature empirically and um, from a modeling perspective, tends to suggest that the impact of green inflation is rather mild. So the adverse supply effect is inflationary, but at the same time, there is a demand suppression, which works in the opposite direction and can be deflationary. The net effect is small, but to be fair, there's not much agreement on this yet, so your study is extremely relevant to inform also this literature. Empirical evidence, so that's for the today contribution of green and climate inflation, uh, of green inflation, suggests that these are rather limited. There's also a nice ECB overview paper that finds limited effects of carbon pricing. This depends also on the geographical coverage, but given that carbon taxation is higher in the EU, Canada, and the OECD than in the entire world, um, we would expect that these effects are not larger in the full, rest, in the full world sample. Next, I want to show you some simulations with larger models coming from a policy institution. Um, first, the colleagues at the ECB have extended their new area-wide model 
to look at inflation and to keep in mind in all these panels, they're not necessarily depicting the same carbon tax pass, but they give you maybe a sense of an order of magnitude that comes from larger models that also explicitly include investment, multi-sector perspectives. So, and there the effects are about an order of magnitude smaller. So the ECB um, neural area wide model with the environment extension, these effects are about 0.5 percentage points, but this also crucially depends on how you specify your Taylor rule, which I will come to next. I also dug out our um, results from the uh, extended Quest model, which is a multi-sector model, and they're really small and depend crucially how the carbon um, tax is treated in the, in the consumer price inflation in the, um, in the Taylor rule. Which brings me to the point that Gauthier had not yet had a chance to discuss, but it's already in the paper it mentioned as work in progress. So I really look forward to, to look more closely at that because the inflationary impact in this kind of model depends very crucially on the conduct of monetary policy. And interestingly here, as the authors clearly state, climate inflation and green inflation create some inflation output trade-off. So in their new Keynesian climate model, the Taylor rule follows um, a usual specification, and I want to highlight two parameters here. First is the output gap stabilization motive. And there's some credibility to that because they estimate the model nonlinearly. So that's, I think, very important to not just calibrate these parameters, but also estimate. Yet the prior is also pretty large, uh, if I read these parameters correctly, at least. And um, it suggests a very strong out output gap stabilization motive. So that's important when looking at the inflationary effects because the monetary policy here also has in mind to stabilize the output gap. The inflation stance, by contrast, seems rather weak. Um, I see here a posterior value of 0 0.6. And if I understand this correctly, this would even violate the Taylor principle. But perhaps using the forward-looking attenuation channels, you can get away. But maybe I'm misreading. Gautier is already shaking his head. So I will focus then on the next point, which is the measure of inflation that is used here is GDP inflation and carbon taxes operating here only on the producer side in that model and not on the consumer side. But that's fine. Um, just want to point it out that it could be interesting to at least comment on it. So my suggestion would be, and we have seen that they have indeed the plan, to explore the role of systematic monetary policy here, because it will be crucial for these effects. So if we say the effect of green and climate inflation will be very large, that's all conditional on the conduct of systematic monetary policy in these models. And interestingly, also monetary policy is conducted here at the world level. So for future work, it could be also interesting to see whether some coordination problems arise or whether climate challenge challenges are more actually related to volatility at the local level that are harder to stabilize than these long run effects. Um, there are several features of forward looking attenuation in the model. There's an exogenous exit probability of firms. There's a discounted Euler equation. There's a credibility of climate policy. And it's important to study th these uh, channels maybe more systematically. So I would suggest to also show these features in a model version without climate change, because I think we can learn something from that also for our standard modeling approaches. Yeah, just a bit of self-advertising here. We use our um, eQuest model here, and we do a more pedestrian way in which we allow um, expectations to adjust in a staggered manner to carbon tax surprises. And you can see that, for example, the green transition is more costly because um, um, if, if policy is not perceived to be credible because investment is delayed and has to be raised faster on. So this could be also interesting for future policy analysis. Another part comparing our models to the new Keynesian climate model proposed by Gauthier and Frank is the multi-sector perspective that is typically found in climate models. So here, I would think that the green transition hinges really on shifting electricity production, mainly from fossil fuels to renewable energies. And here the key parameter is the substitution between green and let's call it dirty energy. And with more sectoral disaggregation, the abatement can also happen via substitution towards another good. Whereas in the New Keynesian framework, which is more stylized and more tractable, there's one sector with abatement costs. So perhaps it could be useful to comment on that, which, which elements you lose and which you, what you gain from the additional 
um, tractability and how this could be mapped, for example, in the larger models that, that have a much more sectoral view on transition costs. And the multi-sector view could also be relevant. We have seen Marco's presentation this morning that there are differences in capital intensity and financial frictions faced by green and dirty firms here. And another element could be the different price stickiness across sectors that might be relevant for monetary policy. And what Del Negro and uh, Olofsson suggest also that the differences in price stickiness across these sectors also have implications for the optimal conduct of monetary policy. So it could be interesting to discuss what, what we miss out by not having a multi-sector perspective on this. And another question that could be answered would be something like, can monetary policy support the required investment? Because recall in the new Keynesian climate model, investment is not explicitly modeled, but there's an abatement cost, which is more of a flow function than a forward-looking investment decision. So that could be interesting as well. Yeah, I'm going to skip that slide, but it's just to highlight that the key challenge in the multi-sector models is the substitution elasticity between green and dirty goods. This is not accounted for in the New Keynesian climate model, but it could be still relevant to explore the sensitivity with respect to the stand-in, which are the abatement costs, and there's also a lot of uncertainty surrounding these. And these are also among the calibrated par parameters and not among the estimated parameters. So it would be nice to see a bit of sensitivity on the quantitative role of these assumptions. Uh, last comment on the welfare costs. So in the laissez-faire um, scenario, in the red scenario, we should look here at panel B in their model, which is basically consumption. The consumption is actually above the... Um, above the Paris Agreement for quite a long time. And so it would be interesting to also compare to other models. At what time do the mitigation costs, are the mitigation costs dominated by the um, damages that are saved? And what maybe support your um, view is that a recent paper in Nature suggests that most of the climate damages until 2040 are sadly already committed and our mitigation policies will have very little effect on these. But for the long run, they will have dramatic effects. So that's interesting. It could be uh, relevant to discuss the time scale of how mitigation costs unfold and um, at what time the consumption patterns are improved relative to a laissez-faire. And last comment in 20 seconds is um, we are looking here at monetary policy conducted at the world level, but it could be also interesting to look at notions such as disasters or um, volatility, because ultimately monetary policy is conducted at the regional or national level. And that might be more interesting to, to also consider how monetary policy should deal with um, these disasters that arise occasionally and reduce the predictability. Yeah, I have a few other challenge, uh, um, comments, but these we can discuss bilaterally. And let me thank you again for the opportunity to read this paper and comment here. Thank you. Thank you very much. So what if you want to... <laughs> so thanks a lot for <clears throat> having so much comment on the paper. Um, I do agree that we had with Frank a lot and uh, Jean-Guillaume a lot of debate about the effect that we find from the model. We, we, we are extremely conservative, you know, because we have we have pushed a lot the attenuation channel as much as we could, and still the numbers are, are really big. And so when I talk to environmental issue, to a macro audience, usually, I mean, people are quite amazed by the size of, uh, of the result that we have. But I think that people also do, do not imagine the, the effort for the society that it is to, to switch to a low carbon economy. And so that's why those numbers are extremely big, because it's a very large structural change that will be extremely costly for the society. And so, so I think that people do not imagine that in 2050, for instance, I mean, we, could, we will not be able to use flight as much as we do right now. And so there is no uh, way of uh, avoiding people to stop using flight because there is no technological break that will allow to, to use flight without emitting carbon emissions. So there is a lot of cost for the society that already emerged you know, in models. Um, so uh, this is the reason that we have huge effects and so the wage, so the standard component that you showed that was 
pretty large, is just a general equilibrium effect. I mean, the economy responds to those changes in a very large fashion, you know, to, to, to dampen the, the, the effect of the carbon tax uh, that is uh, implemented. Um, we also have, I mean, inflation that is much higher than any other models, but I guess also that the models that people have in mind are for developed economies. And so here we worked at the world level, and so think about developed, developed economies, they have not even started you know, their transition. The US has not started at all, but even for developed economy, the cost of changing to low carbon economy is gonna be extremely expensive for them, much more than for us, because we have already started with the ETS market to reduce carbon emission. So if you have the uh, Conan uh, paper in mind with the, 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 the magnitude of inflation they have, because they are working on the, on the, um, on the uh, euro area, and obviously, uh, the magnitude or the distance to reach net zero is much smaller than uh, for uh, the rest of the world. So maybe it's a, a bit of a question of perspective in the way we, we, we see the, the result. You also saw some comment about the Taylor coefficient, and I guess it's probably a typo in the paper, but the Taylor principle is, uh, is, uh, is respected. So uh, the coefficient that we have, that is 0 0.6, is supposed to be one plus 0 0.6. So we just do a switch in the parameter in order to avoid uh, the, the estimation to allow uh, values that will not uh, accept, you know, validate the Taylor principle. And the coefficient, you know, on the, on the, uh, the uh, output gap is, is quite higher than uh, usual. But once again, it's for also developed economies. I mean, it's at a world level. And so central bank for developed economy are probably more dovish than a central bank in, uh, in uh, developed countries. And so once again, I guess, but that's a, just a guess, it's a matter of uh, which type of country we are, we are looking at. You also have a very good point on the multi-sector aspect. I mean, we try to keep the framework as simple as possible. And so I really acknowledge the fact that most of the transition effect will emerge within the input uh, network, uh, input-output network, but through substitution. But once again, once we work on substitution, the question is how, how quick is the substitution parameter going to change over time? And it's extremely difficult to know how much we will switch from complementarity to substitution. Um, and once again, if we replace with those multi-sector uh, models, we have new questions that emerge and that are difficult to answer. And so since we want to keep the framework as simple as possible, uh, we are, we're going to share the code later, and so if people want to make some extension with different sectors, to green versus brown and so on, we'll be happy to see, uh, to see uh, extensions. I do agree that everything is uncertain. I mean, in the parametric perspective, most of the parameters on abatement are quite unknown. You can see that when we go into uh, uh, investment, green investment, I mean, in France, for instance, when we built new nuclear plants, I mean, uh, uh, the, the, the initial cost that was provisioned with the one that is realized is extremely different, which means that it's really difficult to uh, anticipate the true cost of infrastructure changes. And so uh, once again, we, we'll do some robustness check. I mean, this was included in an uh, in a older version of the paper, but we, we intend to include it in the next one. And so abatement costs are going to be one of the key parameters that play a role in the, in the cost of the, on the transition. So thanks a lot also for the welfare, um, the welfare suggestion to see the arbitrage condition between the two scenarios. We'll have a look. I'm not sure that uh, the laissez-faire is going to be, uh, is going to be uh, uh, I, I guess it will be welfare enhancing to, to remain the laissez-faire at least until the end of the century, but we have to check. Uh, this can be a bit uh, difficult to understand and to swallow, you know, for the, the usual audience. And uh, thanks a lot for the, 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 the idea of including volatility that could be increasing with climates. This is something that we have think about, but once again, it's really difficult to make the calibration and know how much uh, volatility would change in the, uh, with respect to, 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 to climate. Uh, so, but thanks. Thank you very much. So now we open the floor for questions. First, I want to abuse my, my power, making a very short uh, clarification, which is about how do you project the path for this uh, inflation target, because all your results are proportional to this inflation target, but if this inflation target is going down, yep. then inflation can, be, can remain constant. So I wanted to know a little bit more about that. Then there is an order. It's uh, Paolo, Marco, Benoit, Ricardo, and uh, let's start from there. So, so please, Paolo. 
And remember, please, to, those, uh, to stand up and identify yourself again for those who are online. Paolo Surico, still at London Business School, relative to 40 minutes ago. <laughs> uh, I, I like this very much. I think it's uh, uh, very useful. Uh, here look like fiscal policy is really a, a, a pain in the neck, uh, in the sense that it's a massive supply shock to which the central bank massively responds. So it was, it's a very useful benchmark. I was wondering whether it could be useful to look at uh, what's happened if the government also change uh, the consumption basket to which uh, uh, the price index that defined inflation target is linked to. Uh, um, and uh, I wasn't sure what the government does with the revenues from the carbon taxes, which will be another obvious way in which the government could try to mitigate the negative effect uh, on, uh, on GDP. So I was wondering whether the combination of the two could be one of the scenario that you might wish to feature in, uh, in a new version, a revised version of, of the model. Thank you. So, Marco? Yeah, uh, quick question. I mean, in, in a way, this was already in the discussion. I, I think the really uh, heroic uh, assumption here is treating the whole world economy with a single Neocasian Neo model. Because many of the things that uh, you know, have to do with climate uh, have to do also with different policies in different countries. I mean, if you take seriously into account the fact that China and India are going to go their own way regarding carbon taxes and we are going our way, uh, you, we may have actually the worst of both worlds because we, we, we will have high emissions, essentially your red uh, scenario, if I remember correctly, eventually, and so all the negative effects that come from that, but we also have high carbon taxes in our uh, economy. So, uh, and you know, and, and, and their policies are going to be different from our policies also on the monetary policy front. And, we, we, and immediately the issue of real exchange rates comes in because essentially we are going to have real appreciation because they, they have uh, lower uh, carbon tax than, than us. And we already see that in our kind of protectionist uh, responses uh, to Chinese uh, uh, policies. So I think this is, you know, if you really want to address uh, with these very interesting tools uh, the issues that you're trying to address, you should definitely have a multi-country and perhaps also multi-sector model uh, of, of, of the world. I mean, that, that would be my uh, suggestion. Of course, that's challenging, but that's the, you know, mm -hmm. the name of the game, I think. Thank you. Benoit? Yes, uh, thank you. Very nice uh, paper. So, uh, Gauthier, you, you, you said you, you would put the, the code online, and uh, I think that's, that's uh, very much welcome. Uh, and uh, many, uh, many teams uh, in central banks are working in this type of models, uh, that's, uh, including in the NGFS uh, research uh, network, uh, where actually the Bundesbank multi sector model and uh, the IMF. Uh, CGMET model, which are online uh, uh, already, are uh, also providing uh, uh, benchmarks. Um, a question which is related to the, to the pre previous two is, uh, I wonder whether in the model you can, um, it, would you have a distinction between what would be a carbon tax and, uh, and the type of uh, transformation that we are seeing currently? with the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, and also very likely uh, um, a dumping of um, Chinese-made electric vehicles uh, to the rest of the world. And, uh, and so it's not clear whether the world would go towards a, a universal uh, a carbon tax. We don't necessarily see it. But it seems that through subsidies and industrial policies, there is this, uh, this wedge uh, which is coming, so is it equivalent in the model? And uh, uh, can you, uh, or, or would there be a distinction, and can you use the model to, to analyze those two different passes of, uh, of uh, subsidized transformation versus um, introducing a carbon tax? Thank you, and Ricardo? Uh, Ricardo Reus from the LAC. I'm gonna repeat Marco's question, but I'm not ashamed of doing it, because I think I'm gonna frame it in a very different way. When we were writing, say, the closed economy, um, New Keynesian model 40 years ago or so, the unit of analysis coincided across all the equations. We had one monetary policy. We had one fiscal policy. The model was built for the US, approximately. 
Uh, we had one unit of trade. In that economy, there was a lot more trade within borders as opposed to out of borders. And so a closed economy was okay to get that discrepancy. We had one country that shared a technology uh, and therefore to assume a common production function was similar. And finally, we had the same unit of account. And in that regard, thinking about price rigidities in terms of when you adjust your price unit of account was appropriate. As I'm trying to build a new Keynesian climate model like you did, you kept that assumption through there being a one country model, let's put it that way, and then we can discuss whether that's the world or the euro area. But when one considers these climate choices, it's clear that that unit is really not the same as you look across these dimensions. Um, for the monetary policy, of course, it's the euro. There's one interest rate, approximately. So, apologies to all the finance people. There are many, but one set by the central bank. But when one thinks about the IS, the fiscal policy, as already been noted by Paulo and others, um, you know, the car your carbon tax is capturing one dimension of climate policy, but there's really very large fiscal policy differences, both in terms of the debt and therefore can I do what you do, which is um, assume your current equivalents have lump sum taxes. Well, not really, because there's going to be massive differences that's going to affect output and inflation. When you think about trade, really here on the climate, the spillovers are very large, and this is what Marco uh, noted, and so insofar as the policy you do, how much of an effect does it have on the carbon on you? Actually very small insofar as the other ones don't. Um, when we think about the productivity, likewise the extent to which, um, as you were saying, the innovation that you spur or not and how your marginal costs get affected matters. And finally, when it comes to the price differences, the real exchange rate ends up being the really big one as opposed to really the price stickiness across the other ones, point to a small open economy. So you're trying to kind of cram all into one unit, but you have these different units going. Um, I don't think it's as simple as what Mark was putting, as saying, well, let's just build a world economy model or not. It's really a choice of each of your equations is asking for a different unit, and you, we need to think about how to reconcile them. And so I worry a little bit about this analysis, how we're trying to cram them all, and how, do you, how would you point to, I don't want to be negative, how would you point to thinking about what the right unit is and in which dimensions? Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so... Okay, please. Let me do it by order then. Um, so Gallo, uh, we have an inflation target that is time varying and exogenous, and it's going to 2% uh, in the end of sample, and really quickly. So is this just you know, for the estimation to avoid that the model capture those changes through unit root shocks? So uh, there is a, I mean, it's converging to the usual 2% uh, totem target. Um, Paolo? Um, yeah, there is a question of revenues, and once again, um, how the, the carbon tax is going, I mean, the revenues of the carbon tax are going to be recycled. Here, we're extremely conservative in the sense that it's given back to household into, uh, in a non-distorsive way, uh, but it could be used in different, uh, in different way, for instance, reducing the inflationary effect on, uh, on, uh, on the production side, it could be given to reduce some taxes on consumption, to also uh, dampen the, the effect. So this is also something that we're going to look uh, in the robustness check, but I'm sure it will play a role on the greenflation term on how at least the economy is, uh, is adjusting to, to this uh, greenflation term. Um, so this question of uh, one country that is a world country and is extremely uh, probably uh, too big, you know, uh, um, in terms of, of focus, uh, I, acknowledge, I acknowledge this, but uh, in, um, in uh, uh, environmental macro, I mean, the IPCC is making forecasts based at the global level, and the DICE model, that is a baseline for environmental macro uh, folks, is, uh, are always using uh, this uh, model at the world level. So we just try to be in the continuation of DICE, probably in an imperfect way, but still uh, in the continuation of it. But we could adapt the setup without having the big uh, multi-country model. We could, for instance, do the same model for equation for the US economy. That would probably make more sense. And the, the last equation, that is the climate change equation, could be simply a, a combination of the US decision plus some exogenous decision from foreign countries. And we would just have to make one simple extension on the emission side for the rest of the world. And in that way, I guess it answered the question of uh, the multi-country issue, because it could be easily adapted with really few changes to a simple country. But once again, there is also the issue of international effect. Uh, 
euro, for instance, I mean, at the Europe level, there is some decision to implement some uh, uh, carbon border adjustments in order to uh, penalize imports which are carbon intensive. These are some way, you know, for, uh, for countries to uh, attenuate the negative effect from implementing a carbon tax domestically. So uh, this kind of effect can be uh, taken into account, but we have to do it in a, uh, at least a two country perspective. And so for us, it's a big beyond the, sto the, the scope of the paper uh, because we wanted to be as simple as possible uh, in the continuation of, 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 uh, of the, the DICE model. Um, with, with respect to your question, Benoit, um, yeah, we could use subsidies in many different ways. I mean, uh, I, uh, um, the, the question is how, uh, how, uh, how subsidies are going to be financed. And here we use the carbon tax, and I mean the carbon tax is, is uh, there is no question about uh, the, uh, the, the, the government debt. Uh, but if we go into subsidies, I'm sure that we have to discuss the question of government debt and how we're going to finance, finance those subsidies in the same way as what the U.S. did. So this is something that we may, can implement, but of course it cannot be done in a four equation problem. So once again, we go a bit beyond the initial scope of the model, but once again, we can make some extension, having some government debt and see how the debt can change over time by uh, financing subsidies to the, the production side. And I think I answered all the questions, if I'm... Okay, so thank you very much. Let me conclude uh, this session, uh, I mean, has been very fruitful.